Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of uh, December 1st, 2016. Um, I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and I am presiding this evening. <clears throat> uh, we will start off before we convene uh, with public comment, and uh, the, the rules for public comment are we ask that you come up, state your name and your address, and then you're allowed to speak on any topic it doesn't have to be something that we're addressing today that's on the agenda but it certainly can be but it can be any topic of your choosing um uh we ask you to keep your comments constrained to three minutes and then we also um ask that you respect the decorum of the of the chamber i i recognize that decorum and chamber in this context might not might seem like an anomaly but we do actually we, we ask that people speak with respect. And um, you ha you'll have three minutes, and there's a clock that will be up there presently, and it'll, st it'll start ticking as soon once you, after you give us your name and your address. So that said, we have three people signed up, and first we uh, have Myla Cabot Zinn, please. Good evening. The last time I was here, it was I'm sorry, Myla. Oh, Could sorry. you? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Um, anyway, I was here a number of months ago to talk about the test lights, the street lights. Um, I wanted to be here for the last meeting, but I was out of town. So now that I'm here uh, seeing the lights going up, um, I have to say I'm, I'm really dismayed, especially in the neighborhoods. Um, it, it was sort of like my worst fears about it have come true. I know you're going to save a lot of money, but when you, I really encourage you to walk in the neighborhoods at night. We're losing something tremendous by putting up these lights without, I mean, they're just complete intense glare. They're kind of blinding. They create these really bright spots and then, sp and then spots that are very dark. Um, and I, th I just think we could have done so much better, especially for the neighborhoods. You don't want to give up the nighttime environment when you're walking. You don't want to make it so that you feel like you're in a mall. And I think that's what's happened. I think we have a very, very intense, um, uncontrolled light spill, and w it's, they're way too bright, and there's way too much glare. So I really encourage you all to get out there before it's too late. Maybe it is too late, but get out there, walk a street like Crescent Street at night. Um, even mm, driving down Nonatuck, there are very definitely light and dark patches that are very distinct, making it hard for the eyes to adjust. And um, I think I think for us to lose the peacefulness at night is huge. Um, there's no reason that we had to go this way. There's no reason why a town needs to give up. Um, you can have good lighting. And I don't think this was a good choice. I don't know what the process was. I'm relatively new to town. I've only been here a year. But I feel like somehow not having enough public comment, not getting people to actually see what's happening until it's too late is a big mistake. So as I said, please, please get out there. Walk the streets at night. Um, see what it feels like. See the sense of um, the enormous glare, the light spill, the lack of um, peacefulness, and whatever you can do at this point to make changes, especially for the neighborhoods, I think would be, would be tremendous. So thanks for listening and. Thank you very much. James Lowenthal, please. Good evening. Uh, James Lowenthal, 181 Crescent Street. Any topic of my choosing? Okay, I'll choose to talk about lights too. Good. Uh, <laughs> um, as uh, some of you know, about two years ago, the long awaited uh, renovation of the Norwatic Rail Trail was completed. And it was great, and it was met with much acclaim by me among many others. Uh, but there was one problem. There was a mistake made, and the tunnels were illuminated with super bright LED lights. Very blue, very bright, totally unshielded against glare. Many bicyclists and pedestrians who use the rail trail commented on it. We had a lot of discussions in the bike community about it. It was completely blinding. As soon as you, you rounded the bend in the rail trail and came within sight of the, the, that tunnel from a half a mile away, it was the brightest thing in your field of view, even with cars oncoming. Uh, 
I went and measured it with a light meter, and the brightness, the level of brightness, was literally 10 times the level recommended for tunnels. Fortunately, as of today, the two tunnels under uh, Route 9 and under uh, Spruce Hill Road and Hadley are completely changed. Now um, there's a simple uh, filter like this over the lights and a simple glare shield that um, I made and installed on each of the lights with the tacit, no, sorry, not tacit, with the explicit um, uh, willing agreement of the Department of Conservation and Recreation, which admitted the lights are too bright, too blue, and unshielded, and that they were better once they saw the effectiveness of the, the glare shield tests that I put up. They agreed, much better this way. Now, don't take my word for it. Go look for yourselves. Go look at those lights, and then go look at the one under Route 116 in Amherst, and you will see what I'm talking about. Northampton is making the same mistake. We have a chance to improve the lights that are going in now and to improve the ones that have not been installed yet but are about to be. There is no reason for glare. It doesn't help anybody. Uh, right now, I have students at Smith coming to me and saying, I have, to now, I have to go buy a black shade for my window when I never had to before. I have other students coming to me and saying, where are the stars in the Milky Way? I come from Maine, and I, I, I am used to seeing the sky. I can't see it anymore. I've heard from other people saying, well, it was nice and dark out there until I got to Northampton. This is all just since the lights have gone in. In my, uh, in my own house, the light now shines clear into the backyard, shines into the guest room. We had guests staying there last night. The shades are not dark enough anymore. There is a solution, as you know, that uh, many of us have been pushing for for months and months, and I haven't heard a good reason why they haven't been tested. Uh, as far as I know, the glare shields that we've even provided to the city are still sitting on the desk um, next door at Central Services, untested as far as I know. People deserve to see those tests so they can decide for themselves what works and what doesn't. Thank you very much. Oh, you. one last thing. I think the current lights are not consistent with the city's uh, lighting code, which says you have to keep the light on your own property. Thank you very much. Thank you. Elizabeth Staples, please. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Staples, and I'm here on behalf of the Good Dog Spot. We're at 139 King Street in Northampton. I'm, I'm here to address the parking, the possibility of 15-minute parking spots in front of our building and how they impact our business. Our location in Chicopee has been functioning for 10 years now, and we probably see on average about 100 clients a day. People drop off for, do for daycare, <coughs> for grooming, and for boarding services. We provide pet care for dogs, but we provide peace of mind and convenience for people. One of the things that we really want here in Northampton is to be able to expedite the drop-off and pick-up process. The 15-minute spots for us will help us get people in and out of the building quickly. It, we are the only <coughs> building on King Street, to the best of my knowledge, that does not have a designated parking spot, uh, parking lot. Um, there is a, there's been two curb cuts put, so we do have two spots. But on average, we go through um, six spots would be our ideal. We figured with four, we'd be in a good place. So the 15-minute spots would certainly help us, um, you know, kind of achieve our goal and make it easier for people <coughs> to drop their dogs off for us uh, during the day. I feel like I could go on from here, but I'm not really sure where else to go, so that's kind of all I want to do is just say that it would be a benefit to us um, and I think to the community who is utilizing our services as we move forward in our venture. Thank you very much. And um, I'm going to try and move your item up on the agenda. Sure. So that if, and if the council has questions for you, they'll, we'll invite you up to speak. Great. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Um, that's all I have listed. Is anyone else interested in speaking at this time? Yes, sir. My name is Rich Badowitz. I'm the treasurer of Trident Realty. We're the landlords at 139 King Street. I'd like to speak on behalf of the two requested 15-minute uh, parking spaces. For brevity's sake, uh, sake, I passed along a little site plan. There are five buildings that are adjacent to 139 King Street. All have dedicated parking lots. 139 King Street is a 12,700 square foot building. It's been impacted by the bike path. If you notice the star, yellow star, it's denoting the loading dock. We used to have access to the back, um, and furniture trucks used to use the loading dock. Um, that's since gone away with the new topography of the bike path. Um, the neighbors around 139 King Street have been uh, 
less than accommodating in terms of allowing us to park in the past when Hamlet Furniture was there. There's always a friendly relationship, but what if, for whatever reason, that collegial relationship has gone away. Um, Elizabeth and Corey Staples have made a substantial investment in the building. Uh, it's been uh, rehab both inside and outside. They're wonderful young entrepreneurs. We hope that uh, from a pro uh, business perspective that you would consider granting that second 15 minute parking space. I think that would make a significant difference in their business. I know my dog uh, was there over Thanksgiving and when I was leaving I was pretty tired. We had uh, come in from a late plane flight the night before and I was thinking about going across King Street with my dog tired over two or four lanes and that's just not a very safe uh, environment especially after you're picking up a dog you haven't seen in a, in a while you're not really paying attention like you normally would so I think from a public safety point of view also the second 15 minute uh, parking space would allow for less would, would allow for a life safety uh, plus uh, those are my comments thank you for your time thank you very much uh, anyone else interested in speaking at this point? Okay. I'm going to ask the administrative assistant to please call the roll. Here. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Here. Councilor Here. Here. We have a quorum, so we are convened. Um, our, my first thing is an announcement for a public hearing. This is um, it's a legal notice of the City of Northampton, the City and Northampton City Council. This is in accordance with Section 6.1 of the uh, Northampton City Charter. The City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, December 15, 2016, at 7.15 p.m. in the City Council Chambers, located at the Walls J. Pachowski building, Municipal Building at 212 Main Street in Northampton, Massachusetts. And the City Council will consider the proposed amendments to the City of Northampton's Administrative Code summarized as follows. One, delete the current Part 1, Section 2.06, Established Information Technology Department and its authorities and responsibilities and establish a Part 1, Section <coughs> 2.06, Information Technology Services Department with authorities and responsibilities which will be expanded to include the Northampton Public Schools. And two, Delete the current Part 2 Multiple Member Appointive Organization Section 3, established Board of Almoners and its authorities and responsibilities and establish a Part 2 Multi Member Appointive uh, Organization Section 3, Whiting Street Fund Committee with authorities and responsibilities. And the City Council will hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. And you will see on your agenda that you have another uh, a public hearing announcement that's been we're ditching that so um, we can uh, what I was going to say was since we have only one member in the in the in the public here who has business here that goes to the second reading all the way down at the bottom of the agenda and I'm I with your permission I'd like to move that item up before we even do the uh, the one minute announcements and things like that. Is make a motion to make objections. Uh, we can now do it just by acclimation. <coughs> That's fine. All right. So let's scroll down. And uh, this is under ordinances. This is item 16.175, right? Yes. This uh, an ordinance to amend Schedule 3 limited time parking from Chapter 312 of the Code Book. Second reading, I'll accept a motion to put it on the floor. Make a motion. Second. Okay. Discussion, as I said, we do, and the mayor may want to comment, and I know that um, uh, Ms. Staples is here, too, to offer any information if you have questions. Um, let me describe, then, in that case, let me describe some of the disposition and somewhat of the debate that occurred last time. And by the way, it passed uh, first reading. Um, with some objections, I was one of the objections, but it's essentially uh, some of the, uh, there was a lot of discussion relative to what you spoke about, um, the, the, the desire and need. There were some questions about 
what the parking volume was on the on that front space. You've now addressed that, and, and Rich has two with two spaces. Um, so, and the majority uh, did approve it. So, and, but that was the modified version with one space allowed for 15-minute parking, with the other standing is um, the ex under the uh, standing ordinance. So. Any discussion on the, on the proposal from the? Um, <coughs> well, I can speak to the comment in the ordinance committee because that's I think was its last stop before it got here. Right, and that would be legislative matters. Right. I'm showing my age. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Just to be clear, the committee formerly known that's as the right. ordinance committee, <laughs> uh, and it came to us from transportation and parking, but what came up in that committee and where it got changed was that in that general area on that side of the three street there's three parking spaces which were typically i think one hour spaces and the request was to turn two of them into 15 minute spaces for the benefit of this one business and it's quite true that everybody else has dedicated parking this business does not and the discussion at ordinance was um to take three spaces and dedicate two of them to the benefit of a specific building might have been a little much. Maybe we should leave two of them that way. And the fact that you could park for 15 minutes in a one-hour space. If you if you wish to, chances are you'd come and go. Um, there are three spaces there. I can't imagine that the parking attendants get up there very often because there's only three spaces. And uh, you could get in and out of there. Um, but it did come from transportation as parking uh, with an okay for the two. And then in ordinance, the discussion was, well, maybe we shouldn't take you know, the majority of them and turn them over into 15 minute spaces. Uh, so that change happened in ordinance. Um, but I might ask Councilor O'Donnell, since you were uh, in the discussion in transportation and parking and also in the discussion in ordinance to speak to that as well. So I, I'd be happy to, Councilor. Uh, I don't have much to add from what I said at the last meeting. Um, I just think that if you, well, as Councilor Murphy can tell you, uh, real estate has has value and certainly parking spaces have value and we're not talking about spending money on them or diverting revenue from these parking spaces but we no one can dispute that there's a substantial amount of value in a parking space and you could ballpark it any number of ways um, you know I, I won't do that now but if you're going to transfer a significant um, piece of public value to what is effectively exclusive use of one business, I think you have to have a good um, good reason. And I'm just not convinced that the need is there at that time, um, at this time. During the Transportation and Parking Commission meeting, we discussed this. Um, I don't think it was clearly established then, and I don't think it's clearly established now what the need is. Certainly, every time I drive by, I see empty spaces. and. One thing that was not brought up in the Transportation and Parking Commission, but was revealed later, is there are two dedicated spaces there already. So I think that you know we ought to be cautious. Uh, I don't support any 15-minute spaces, but the council kind of split the difference at the last meeting, and in council we amended it uh, to one 15-minute space. So that's where it stands. Uh, Council of the Bards and then Council of the Bards. Right. Well, was it brought up about at parking and transportation giving them at least one 15 minute parking? To me, I have great concerns because the businesses that have been there, which was a furniture company before, and there were cars parked out there, people that would go in and look at furniture and so forth, but I have concerns about the dogs in general. I mean, when they're being groomed, bathed and groomed, and then coming out with their owners, I feel there's a difference here in this type of a business of keeping this animal safe. And the closer that a at least one parking space in front of that business, to me, is very valuable for the animal's sake. Um. There was a question in there, and it was directed to you. I don't oh, know. did I not answer your question? I'm sorry. No, no, uh, no from, from Councilor Barge. Barge. Oh. She, she was asking if that was discussed in transportation and parking. 
I mean, as I recall, I, I would say perhaps generally, yeah, but it wasn't until council, of course, that we um, made the amendment to change one 15-minute proposed space, uh, excuse me, two to one. Um, I mean, the other principle, Councillor, I, I think that's relevant here is other 15-minute spaces we've created in the city have a wider use and value. Because again, we're talking about public property. And for example, elsewhere on King Street, a curb cut was closed in front of the old Bank of America building and a new space was put in. Um, it was actually Goggins Real Estate who asked that it be a 15-minute space because it would help their business. It's different, number one, because it's a new space, but also in that part of King Street, you may not technically be in central business, but you start to be. And a variety of businesses would be well served by this space. Um, and that is, I think, a test that is uh, very important to remember. In this case, this business, uh, this situation does not meet that test. Um, it would be different if there were a high demand that's been demonstrated that would sort of allow us to bypass that important test about the use of public property for private purposes. But that demand has not been demonstrated. So I don't see why, why we have the rush to do this. Certainly not two spaces. And like I say, uh, I oppose even one space because it, it seems like there's plenty of spaces that can be used by customers to keep animals safe and to patronize the businesses. Thank you, Councillor, because the, mm -hmm. I felt that one space at least would be adequate enough for a dog after they're being groomed and placed in the car being safe. And a point of information, there are two dedicated spaces, as the, um, Mr. Matterwitz points out with his map. Councillor Murphy. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there are three spaces on that side of the street, and I think those are the last three dedicated spaces all the way up King Street. Now, there's any more parking spaces for the rest of the way up there. And I can't imagine that there's a heck of a lot of traffic enforcement on those three spaces anyway, since they're so isolated, it's not economically all that viable to go up there and enforce those. So, for me, if they're 15 minute spaces and somebody stays in them more than 15 minutes, they're not going to be enforced. If they're hour spaces, that's as good as a 15 minute space because, again, you can stay in there 15 minutes if it's an hour space. So I don't really feel compelled one way or the other on this one because I think, given the actual enforcement in the area, it doesn't matter that much. So I'll, I mean, I'll leave it to you. I don't mind if they're two 15 minute spaces or one 15-minute space, practically speaking, it's going to work out the same either way. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think I'm really compelled to say, hey, we're saving valuable real estate here because it's going to work out the same one way or the other. Councilor Bidwell. It may be that practically it would work out the same, but I, I, I still, uh, even though this has been cast as are you pro-business or, or not, mm -hmm. um, I don't particularly like that way of looking at this issue. For me, the principle remains that I, I'm uncomfortable with dedicating uh, a, a public parking space essentially to, to one business. I think that's a bad precedent for us to set. Other 15-minute spaces in town, have, as have been observed, uh, serve multiple businesses. And for me, that's the, that's the, that's the critical principle here. And whether it's one space, to, to, to split the difference and say, well, let's do one space, it doesn't change the fact that in principle, I think it's, a, it, it's the wrong way to go and it sets a precedent that I would not be comfortable with. So my position has not changed from two weeks ago. Any other discussion? Dr. Council Nash. Uh, you know, I, I'm comfortable with the compromise we came up with last week um, or two weeks ago. Um, I, you know, I support the idea of the you know I still support the idea of supporting businesses in this area right now this is the one active business um, well there is the the auto place but the two of these storefronts are now empty and um, that I you know I, I think we should do things to support growth in this area um, this is entranceway business uh, that the the plan down the road is to redesign this part of King Street and encourage on-street parking um, so down the road, I anticipate more uh, situations like this, and so um, I am supportive of it. Okay. Any any other comments or discussion? Okay. 
So uh, this is an ordinance. We'll do a roll call, please. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? No. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? No. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? No. Councilor Shera? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? No. Okay. Do I call you? Yeah. Yes, you call them all. I do. So it's 5 4. Doesn't pass. Or does it? Um, I think it was a simple majority, I think, on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it does it's pass. A majority. So that passes in second reading, and with it is space. done. Mm -hmm. the one, with one space, not with both spaces. Just so. Okay. Now we scroll back to the top. And. No, I'm sorry. The, sorry, Rich. This is this was in session. If we invited, if we had questions, we would have invited you to speak. But that was. Um, and by the way, just for a note at the end, of course, these are all subject to change depending on circumstances and as conditions change. So, should the, should there be a demonstrable need, and it turns out, that, then I'm sure we'll be revisiting this. Well, I hope it's not a case where somebody's hurt. I, I agree with you. Um, now we have one minute announcements. Any counselors? Any one minute announcements? No. I, I got oh. one. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that this Sunday is the hot chocolate run for Safe Passage. Um, it's one of my personal favorite days of the year. Um, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everybody who makes this event happen. It's um, an unbelievably complicated and big thing to pull off and many people are involved. Um, and if you're not registered already, sorry, you're out of luck. It, it uh, sells out weeks in advance. Um, but you should come and cheer people on and support everyone and um, experience you know, the beauty and the love and just the unbelievable heart that really represents this community that we live in and we're really fortunate to be a part of. And the other one minute announcement. Okay. Communications proclamations from the mayor don't seem likely. So <laughs> he scoffed it off. Um, it's <clears throat> when we come up to this is second reading for the resolution. This is the res, uh, item 16206, a resolution declaring Northampton's commitment to being a safe and accepting community. I'll accept a motion. We'll approve it. Second. <coughs> for the discussion on this item. <coughs> Uh, would you prefer a roll call or roll call. A roll call on this? Okay. Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. 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 That passes unanimously in second read. Thank you. Thank you. I've got my trustworthy empathy. Thank you. Uh, Sadly, no PowerPoint presentations available today. Um, this probably would have been the day to do it, but uh, now we come to the consent agenda, and this is including uh, approval of the minutes of uh, November 17th, 2016. Also, item 16.210, various appointment committees, and that's for referral to the Committee on City Services. First up, we have the Community Preservation Committee, Linda Morley of 244 Prospect Street, Northampton. Uh, the term running January 2017 to January 2019. It's a reappointment. At the Council on Aging, we have Donna Park of 205 Prospect Street, Northampton. The term uh, to uh, begin November 2016, expiring June 2019. This is replacing the expired term of Walter Bach. Uh, Mark Najami, or Najame, is uh, 47 High Street in Florence. Uh, the term to start November 2016 and expired June 2019, replacing the expired term of Margot Welsh. Also on the Historical Commission, we have Barbara Blumenthal of 39 Chapel Street, Northampton, the term uh, starting September 2016, expiring June 2018's reappointment. Uh, Bruce Kravisky of 23 Ice Pound Drive in Florence, term starting September 2016, expiring June 2018, also a reappointment. And another reappointment, David Drake, of 321 Locust Street in Florence, the term to start 2016 to go to June 2019. We also have 
Martha Lyon, who's also a reappointment, 313 Elm Street, Northampton, the term starting 2016, expiring June 2019, and Dylan Gaffney of 23 Marshall Street, Northampton, uh, also a reappointment term starting September 2016, expiring June 2019. Zoning Board of Appeals, Bob Riddle, 47 Water Street in Leeds, the term runs from March 2015 to June 2018. This is a reappointment, March 2015, okay. Um, Sarah Northrup of 147 Hinkley Street in Florence, the term starting March 2016, uh, expiring 20, June 2019, also reappointment. And David Bloomberg of 86 Vernon Street in Northampton, term starting March 2015, again, uh, and expiring June 2018 also reappointment we have no finance committee today because there's no oh yeah we got to you got to approve the minutes i'm sorry so we'll go in <laughs> yep move to approve the consent. second i'm sorry second yeah i'm frogging i'm just running it too quickly all right now we'll go into uh, uh, all those in favor of uh aye. Aye. Consent. Consent. Aye. say aye but opposed okay they don't have to approve their minutes. Okay, no finance meeting. So, again, up, we have a series of second readings. Item 16.196 is in order to purchase 20.7 plus or minus acres on Water Street in Leeds. Is there a motion? Moved. Second. No motion's made in second. Any discussions? Roll call, please. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Tony? Yes. Councilor Yes. That passes in second reading. Item 16.197, in order to purchase 55 plus or minus acres on the easterly side of Coles Meadow Road with an easement. Move we'll to approve. Motion's made and second. Any discussion? Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. 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 Councilor Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Passes in second reading. Item 16.198 in order to purchase 30.7 acres in the Mineral Hills Conservation Area. Move to approve. Second. Discussion? <clears throat> Councilor Bidwell. Uh, I was just going to note that when we reviewed this matter two weeks ago, um, we asked Wayne Biden if he might provide us with, a, with an overall map of the Mineral Hills Conservation Area so we could put it in context and see how the pieces fit together. He's obviously not here tonight and it's not going to hold up the vote, my vote, but. He did give you the map and Right. He did? Yeah. Yes. We yeah. yeah. so got that. The map and an inventory. Everything. Yeah. Oh. And a census. Yeah. That was, I'm. It's from Pam. I, I, <laughs> Delete, delete those previous comments. I did not, I, I did not see that map. My apologies, Wayne. He, he did the. Uh, the requested okay. like comment on assess values of things we were taking right. into My apologies. Did not see it. Uh, any further discussion or questions? Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. Item 16.199, this is in order to approve budgetary transfers in the health department. Move to approve. Second. Uh, motion's made and seconded for second reading. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Murphy. Uh, <laughs> This is in second reading. Item 16.201, in order to appropriate $7,500 to pay for services related to roofing replacement schematic design feasibility study for the Bridge Street Elementary School. Second. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any discussion on this? Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. 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 Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Item uh, 16.202, in order to appropriate $7,500 to pay for services related to roofing replacement schematic design feasibility study for Leeds Elementary School. Second. 
discussion. Roll call. Councilor Scherer? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Bush? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor Obama? Yes. Passes in second reading. Uh, item 16.203 is an order to surplus property located at 221 Riverside Drive, aka the Fiker School. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sherrill? Yes. That passes in second reading. Item 16.204, this is an order to approve intermunicipal agreements for the paramedic intercept services and PVTA services. Second meeting. Move to approve. Motion's made and second. Discussion. Roll call, please. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Passes in second meeting. Item 16.209, in order to authorize the consolidation of IT services for purposes of first group. And uh, accept a motion, put it on the floor first. Excellent mm -hmm. motion. The mayor's here to talk about this. Yeah, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I have a couple. Uh, That's all right. A couple, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I have a couple uh, handouts to people to share if you just want to take one and pass sure. it down. Uh, so as you know, um, uh, information technology has been a major emphasis of, um, of my administration. And in 2014, we, um, we completed an assessment with the Collins Center of our overall IT systems. Um, and we've been working very hard in the last couple of years to um, to implement the, the many recommendations contained in that study. Um, and one of the key recommendations of the uh, IT uh, report uh, was, was consolidation, was really looking, uh, particularly co first consolidation within the city, um, consolidating some of the disparate um, IT resources that we had. Um, and then a long-term <coughs> goal was consolidation, ultimately between the city and the school's IT systems. Um, so what I have uh, for you tonight, and I'll just sort of go through it as a visual. So currently, um, we have a city IT department, and then NPF has its own IT department. Um, so there's basically an IT director for, for each, um, each department. Um, we call it an IT director. They call it the district technology coordinator. Um, and then the uh, NPS has uh, three staff, um, I, and the city has four staff. Um, two, several, three of the staff um, are doing many of the same, uh, many of the same tasks, albeit in separate spheres. Um, in talking with the superintendent about this, and this is something that's viewed as a, as a best practice around the state, many other um, communities have moved toward this, uh, Westfield being a, a great example. Um, uh, my colleague in Salem, has, who also did a Collins study report, is, is also doing the same consolidation. Um, you know, it's, a, a lot of these are the same systems. We have um, all of our school and city buildings are all on the same network. Um, so all of the information is flowing along the same network. Um, and, and so uh, what the superintendent uh, in our conversations about this uh, wanted to try to do and in and, and, and forming this consolidation was really um, leave the sort of the back office maintenance of IT, the, you know, keeping the networks running, keeping the databases running, um, servicing all the desktops, doing all that kind of stuff. And in the schools, um, having the focus be more on how is technology applied in the classroom, you know, focused on, you know, at the teaching level, um, not, not worrying about, um, you know, uh, how things operate. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this is the proposed uh, merger of the, um, of the city's IT um, department. Same number of employees. Um, there's uh, no uh, change in the number of employees. Um, and what is happening essentially is, um, and part of the reason that the timing for this uh, was good, was <coughs> that the um, district's um, IT coordinator is retiring in January. So it kind of provided an opportunity to kind of relook at that structure. 
Um, so what the school committee has approved, and this is basically a vote that you're, that in order to share services um, among a city and school district, um, there's the, uh, this vote is required under Mass General Law. Both the school department has to take it, the school committee has to take it, and the city council has to take it. Um, it's happened two times previously. We currently share um, uh, facility management services. We have a combined central services department, uh, which is a city department, um, but it has elements of um, of uh, school custodial and school maintenance combined. Um, and then our HR department did a similar merger a few years ago. There's no longer, many school districts have a separate school HR department and a city HR department. We merged ours together, so we have one uh, combined HR department. Um, so um, what's happening is with the retirement of the district technology coordinator, uh, the district is going to basically uh, repurpose that position. Um, it'll be a, a sort of a downgraded position, um, but creating a digital learning and computer science coordinator. This will be the person who's really working on how is technology applied in classrooms, working with each of the um, technology specialists that are in every building, um, and really be focusing on that. Um, and then it'll be the IT department, uh, citywide department's responsibility to keep, you know, to keep the data flowing, to keep things back up, to work with implementing software, to do all those kinds of things. It doesn't really show up well in this, I don't know why, um, color-wise, but on the ones I showed you, um, it's important to look, if you look at the, um, if you look at the uh, before, uh, the before slide, you'll see that the four system specialists are all uh, in green, um, and then on the school side, the, the three um, school uh, department employees are all in yellow. Um, when you move to the after slide, um, you'll see that in the newly configured IT department, um, there's still the blend of colors. The reason why we did that is um, the way this will function is the school department will continue to fund um, the employees that it currently funds in its own department. Um, so, uh, and including continuing to fund the digital learning and computer science coordinator. So uh, they will continue to fund this. So in terms of the number of staff, it's a net, no net change in staff. And from a budgetary perspective from the city, there's no uh, net change. There'll be a slight change because um, there will probably be a, a differential uh, between the expanded role of, the, of our current IT director um, but again, there's a downgrading of the, of the digital learning and computer science coordinators, which has been advertised. The school committee approved that, um, approved that uh, already. But I don't think, I think the difference will be negligible, and I think the key thing is we'll be really providing what is now a pretty much a vital infrastructure uh, for the day-to-day -day business operations of the city um, in a much more efficient uh, manner. Um, and I highlighted, um, uh, you know, in the in the Collins Center report, you know, one of the key things of having, um, you know, an organization that's a little bit larger and combined is that you have the ability to cross train people. You have the ability to create more redundancy within the staff. Um, right now, we sort of have these two silos, and there's you know one specialist in sort of each area, um, in in those silos. And that we basically, you know, have two of them. In each, in each of the, in, in of each of those in the department, so there'd be cross training. There'd be the ability to, um, if if someone's not there, if someone leaves, etc. Um, there's the ability to have backup because this is a 24/7. Um, because the the IT department is not only taking care of you know city hall, um, they're also taking over and beginning to take care of our public safety infrastructure as well under under the ongoing consolidation that's happening internally. So. So what's basically happening is, you know, no change in the number of staff, um, and it's really just a reconfiguration and kind of a separation between, um, the, you know, the, the hardware, the software, the network um, uh, support being done under one combined department, and the technology piece being uh, really being the, set, the sole focus in the schools. The superintendent of schools, um, uh, will appoint the digital learning and computer science coordinator. Well, it's a, it's a school committee created position, and the superintendent will um, will appoint that person. Um, but you see up there, there's coordination that will happen between 
the chief information officer and the digital learning uh, coordinator, as well as the superintendent of schools. So they'll be, you know, the, the way I've been trying to focus it is it's actually less of a merger. It's more that the, um, the IT department is basically taking on a new client. Uh, you know, the school will be one of the departments that it serves. It'll be one of its one of its clients. In addition to all the city side, they will be one of the clients. Um, and part of that support, just like supporting Chief Casper, you know, with their needs, and supporting you know, Chief Nichols, will be supporting this digital learning and computer science coordinator uh, to make sure they have the hardware and the bandwidth and the tools that they need uh, to carry out the learning in the schools. So that's the proposal. As you know, this is kind of a two-pronged one because. Um, it requires a change in the administrative code, uh, but in order to even get to the administrative code piece, um, this vote on the state law has to be taken. So the way, we, the way I've timed it is to have a first reading on the acceptance of the statute um, to coincide then with the second reading the same night that you'll have your hearing um, on the administrative code change um, so that they would both line up at the next meeting. So that's the background, and I'm happy to answer questions. Oh, um, you mentioned the budgetary implications. Yes. I'm wondering if for our second vote you can kind of bring us that breakdown so that sure. we can actually see what, sure. how it plays yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. And the other piece that I'm just curious about is I see that um, there is, for instance, a position under the schools currently, the help desk specialist. Yep. That doesn't, that it doesn't seem like there's a similar position for the city. And I'm just wondering if this will actually allow for different departments to utilize um, that help desk specialist. I mean, is this allowing for that? Yeah, kind of what well, we we have our we have a help desk system as well that, that we've implemented as well. Um, and for those at home, a help desk is basically an online way for people to report problems with IT. Um, instead of calling up and saying my computer doesn't work, um, you report it online and you and you get a ticket and it's a way for them to be able to manage problems and report problems and, and be able to close out. Um, so the help desk, and also if people just have general questions, they can go through the help desk system. So we actually are using a help desk. We don't call our person a help desk specialist, um, but what we're actually, that's gonna be one of the other advantages is combining the two help desk systems. Because right now there's a help desk in the, um, in the schools and there's a help desk system in the city. So that's going to be one of the other efficiencies that we'll be able to. Uh, to so does improve. that mean that one of these four positions has less responsibility? No, not at all. The... No, actually, what's happening now is basically everyone in the IT department is sort of managing the help desk system. Everyone is sort of working on the help desk system, um, and and this is actually going to. And we've been working toward trying to get someone. You know, the school started with a halftime person. We talked for a while about if we got a halftime person, we could, we could maybe share it that way. Um, this is going to basically, we'll have that person, and we can allocate their time uh, to make sure that the help desk support for both the city and the school. We're also going to merge the two help desk systems. Right now, we have a separate help desk in the schools and a separate help desk in the city, and that really won't be necessary anymore. So, um, you know, uh, my 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 expectation is to have. Um, Mr. Pagan come to the next meeting for the public hearing, um, and he could really talk to you about what he sees are the operational advantages of this and can talk about that um, specifically. So, um, and again, it's, an, it's also a unique opportunity because Mr. P Pagan, our, our um, amazing IT director, um, also has a background in education. Um, he previously was the IT director for the collaborative um, and, uh, and has a lot of experience in the educational sphere. So it's sort of like the stars are aligned because we have somebody who already has a lot of understanding of school network needs um, and school you know, application needs. So he's sort of tailor-made to be able to make this merger happen. So, But I, I can have him here um, to be able to answer uh, those levels of questions. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this chart to show you it. I'm not asking you to approve the job descriptions or approve the organizational structure. Just allow us to enter into a shared services agreement so that we can uh, so we can make this um, consolidation happen. Councilor Bart, should you have a question? Yeah. Well, Alyssa Klein, Councilor Klein, answered my question hearing from the mayor that we are bringing in um, for our second reading the IT director, which I think is very valuable. Definitely. Yeah. Council Van and then Council Murphy. 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think I think this is, this is great, and um, I guess it's kind of in the spirit of merging the treasurer and, and collector mm -hmm. in the sense that you're seeking efficiencies, and mm -hmm. um, I think it'll make city government work better. So I, I think it's great, and I support it. Um, is it okay to, to ask a little bit about the the structure? Because certainly, totally for yeah. approving the uh, sure. I just want to stay within the the right. I want right, to be yeah. germane here to the topic. Yeah. Because um, we're approving a agreement, the structure True. is relevant to some degree. Yep. Um, one question I had is maybe it's just a failing of, of having boxes and arrows. Um, but if you look at it, the chief information officer seems to report the two people. I know that's probably not actually the case. Yeah, no. But I'm just wondering, and I imagine your administrative order will flesh it out a little bit yeah. more. But yeah, that was actually. It probably should have been a dotted line. Okay. There's, 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 um, there's, uh, and I was, I, I had a, Dr. Provost and, and uh, Mr. Pagan are, are, you know, this is their flow chart that they came up with, uh, which has like, you know, it's like this more modern org chart that's all kind of flowy and there's, you know, lines of communication and there's lines of supervision and there's lines, so theirs is like this much less you know, linear looking thing, but, but essentially the way the job descriptions are written, um, you know, this will be basically the IT, the chief information officer will be a department head of the mayor, will remain a department head of the mayor. We were mainly trying to show those arrows to show that there would still be collab, you know, collaboration. Because for this to work, you can't, you can't again set up two silos where mm -hmm. you have somebody who's working on learning and you have somebody who's supposed to provide the hardware and there's no coordination. So, um, in the job description for the digital learning and computer science coordinator, which the school committee voted on and approved, um, it does say that the superintendent is the appointing authority, and actually the the superintendent and the chief information officer of the city are the are the sort of supervisors of that person. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the department head status of the chief information officer, it's still a city department who reports directly to the mayor. Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, it's mostly we're talking about uh, sort of the infrastructure um, piece of it. And you certainly do the same thing with central services and we do. actively yeah. manage. Yeah, and you know, and, and probably you know, the, the, the digital learning coordinator is going to be look, working on more on things like, you know, the um, smart boards and how to use those and how to implement other kinds of you know technologies in the classroom. And um, Antonio and his team is going to be worried, going to be making sure there's the data to support it and that you know if the PCs are broken, they get fixed and reordered and that kind of stuff. So um, it's a, it's I think it's a better division of labor and again the whole idea of having like you know you know only one person who knows how to manage a particular database system um, and there's a very similar one in the schools and so to have that that shared resource just makes sense for redundancy um, well, um, we're in the capital improvements process at this point and it's been something that we've asked about for a long time to integrate these two operations because IT wise we're really one big city and the information flows between the the general government side and the public safety side and the school side asking for this to happen for a really long time and uh, the IT director soon to be chief information officer actually presented to us and it's it's been great that that one department now is saying hey we need switches at the high school the, 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 the dispatch center is going to be our new hub, but the backup hub is in the schools. So the school feeds will back up the city side and the city side will back up the school side. So it is one like apostolic technology system. And they have two separate components running. It really didn't make a lot of sense administratively or economically. Uh, and and the, what he presented the other night uh, pretty nicely distributed our resources between schools and city and one backs up the other. Our new IT phone system services the city and the schools. It's so integrated that it's really hard to have two separate fiefdoms integrating one information system that services general government, public safety, and schools. It, it makes a lot more sense to do it this way. And I think when we did our, our study of our IT needs, this is what they prescribed. And well, the Collins Center yeah. prescribed the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it really does make a lot of sense. So I'm glad. With the retirement, we have the opening to actually fulfill this and make this happen. Yep. Um, 
and I, and and I, one of the other things that Mr. Pagan is going to be coming to present to you uh, soon, it may not be on the 15th, but very soon is, is uh, you may recall that you funded a broadband study um, analysis, and that's going to be one of the issues. But one of the early opportunities that this is going to present, which we've already been working on even before the broadband study, is the um, the schools are a consumer of internet service. They 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 have they sort of have to buy internet separately from the city um, because they get um, educational institutions gets what something called E-rate, uh, which is a program of the federal government that basically f helps subsidize um, internet service for educational institutions. So uh, right now they purchase internet service, um, and it's done in not a very effective and, or efficient way. They're basically you know, having Comcast hookups at every school. Um, and, and bandwidth has been increasingly a major issue in the schools, uh, particularly now that we're going to like park testing that's all going to be online and some of the other testing uh, requirements that's, that uses huge amounts of data. So one of the other pieces of this is that we are going to be, um, as part of another uh, project we've been working on, um, basically becoming a, um, an internet provider ourselves or having the ability to provide internet service um, and actually be the internet provider to the schools. So they will basically contract with us through E-rate to provide internet service. We can get it at a much um, more secure uh, and a higher gigabyte range because we have a dedicated connection through our participation in the five college fiber network to the state's data center in Springfield. Um, so we're able to access that. So that's something else that we'll, he's working on. And then, of course, that opens up the possibilities that we've talked about. And he's going to present some of those findings about um, the other possibilities for broadband expanding beyond that. Um, so, so, yeah, there's a lot of great opportunities. This is going to benefit the schools. And I think that's the, you know, the main thing. You know, the, the thing that Superintendent Provo said is like, look, we want to focus on learning. Like, we, you know, we want to, our focus needs to be on learning and on classrooms, not fixing computers. And so, you know, we, it, to have our time and resources allocated to that and have an IT department doing that, it just makes sense. We're not a big enough city uh, to be able to have these two separate um, identical departments. So, so uh, this is just the first reading to allow the state uh, acceptance of the state law, and then next time we come back for the public hearing, and I can have Mr. Pagan um, talk to you about any other specific questions you have. Council Nash, then Council yep. O'Donnell. So I'm trying to figure out how to frame this, but so we're approving the sharing of two different information systems, and I that um, that I'm trying to think of the you know the the complications. So I as somebody who's worked with school departments, that they're, you're dealing with all sorts of confidential information. And, um, you know, uh, IEPs, all of oh, that yeah. stuff. So would all of those be going over as well? I mean, so um, with, the, with the idea being that, um, that, so school staff now need to be fingerprinted and background checks. Yeah. And I'm sure some of that also has to be done for yeah current technology folks. Yep. Um, is this a good mix? I mean, well, technology-wise, it makes sense okay. because we're thinking, you know, oh, well, you know, well, we got a website here, a website, you know, and, you know, and it, we have data. But they're, they're functioning under different um, uh, well, we're man rules. I, I could just say we're managing the police database, which is as sensitive, if not more sensitive, that okay. has everyone's license information, criminal background <coughs> information, it's processing evidence, it's processing all of that. Uh, in the fire station, we're processing HIPAA records. You know, we have, you know, we have to deal with HIPAA because we're, every time we go on a medical call and, and perform medical procedures. HR is on here. Or, yeah, HR. So we're already dealing with highly sensitive information. And so this isn't really going to be a change. You know, the, the other pieces that we've been working on have, and I should talk about, um, for those of you who have ever seen the city's um, IT department, you're probably wondering how are we going to fit eight people in there. Um, and we're not actually going to do that. We're fine. That was one of the other recommendations of the study was to like get the IT department out of its current location, which is kind of below sea level in the um, in the basement of this building, um, which floods when it rains too hard and and um, and also has electrical issues. So. 
Um, a couple of things we've been doing. Uh, we've 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 moved all of our servers uh, that used to be in the basement of City Hall. If you ever came in the basement, and sometimes the janitor's room is open, you'd see a a data box in there filled with all kinds of servers and stuff. Um, and it was one of the more dustier places to have a server system. So we've consolidated all of our servers um, on the city side and we've moved them now to the fire station, uh, which is a 24 hour secured facility and has a backup generator and it's our emergency center. So we've moved all those over there. So all of the servers that contain this information are now in a secure location. We also have uh, separate um, server backups in the police station um, as well, the other 24-hour secure server. So we've done a lot of work to secure our data and, and move it apart. Where we're going to ultimately put the staff now is um, is going to be in the James House. I don't know if you're familiar with the, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the James House, but there's a suite in the James House that we're um, in the process of reconfiguring, and that's going to become the new city centralized city IT department. Um, and so, but again, none of the servers or any of that inf stuff is going to be there. It's all virtual going over this secure network. Um, and those servers are, you know, behind locked doors with, in one case, people with guns. In another case, you know, uh, p uh, you know, there's a, it's in the dispatch center, which itself is secured and, and is not open to the public. So, so there's a lot of security precautions going in here and a lot of cyber security precautions. And again, Mr. Pagan can, can put you at ease about that. But in terms of sensitive information, good point, but we are, we're, we're aware of it. We have all. it covered. Good. We have it covered, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Councilor O'Donnell and then Councilor Labar. I might actually wait till Mr. Pagan is here. I was just going to kind of speculate. You might have other uh, procurement. Um, savings or advantages in addition to internet, maybe just for, through planning across the schools. And yeah, I mean, and that's one of the things, uh, sort of step one of consolidation in the IT department. You know, when I got, when I got elected and, and started making budgets, um, IT was being purchased out in all the departments mm -hmm. and, you know, Department A was buying their computers and Department B was buying their computers. And so one of the things we did as part of that consolidation was we said, everything needs to go through the IT department. Like, you know, don't even send me a, re a capital request unless it's been approved. And then we've now eventually moved all the computer purchasing through IT. So they're the ones who come forward mm -hmm. um, to, to, to bring that forward. So we're buying, you know, platforms that are compatible and we're buying software that we, you know, and we're consolidating licenses. And so mm -hmm. that's happening. Um, and then we've also, the other thing that we found here is that some departments had their own um, either uh, in-house or outsourced IT staff. We're slowly transitioning away from that. Okay. Um, so that's also happening. So again, everybody um, is working. And actually, it's, it's actually working really well. We have uh, another recommendation in the study which we've implemented was to form uh, an IT um, steering committee. Uh, which consists of key users of IT in the city and the IT director, um, and that they meet on a regular basis to talk about issues, to work on system-wide projects like the phone system, mm -hmm. uh, the purchase of the phone system. We're purchasing a permitting uh, system that's going to upgrade an, an old one. Um, so, so there's a lot of that stuff that's going to happen, and it's it's definitely going to save money, and it's going to make a, we're going to make smarter purchasing choices. Okay, thank you. And just so I'm clear, is procurement for is IT procurement for the schools in terms of hardware currently? Um, no, not at all. Okay. No, nope. no, nope. they, okay. no, that would come through the IT director okay. of the schools. Yeah, okay. they they came through, uh, you know, things like switches and any of those kinds of things were a separate thing. They weren't discussed. You know, they okay. weren't reviewed by the cur by the city IT department. That'd be a welcome change. So. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Council Lamar. Uh, just to say, it sounds like a very impressive step. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be supportive of it. Mm -hmm. And I can, again, get you the budget numbers on it next time. Uh, you know, part of it is the, um, I can give you some estimated ones. Part of it is the um, IT director in the schools doesn't retire till January. They're <coughs> advertising. They'll have to hire the new person. But we can estimate, you know, what that job will be posted at, what the other job, to give you uh, an understanding of it. Um, but I think, you know, it'll the difference will will be minimal, and I think the benefits will be uh, will be major in terms of what we we'll, we'll be able to do. Um, 
you'll also notice it's not really, it's not part of this, but in the other order, um, there's a slight name change, and that was actually one, you know, there's the study recommended IT department or IT services department, and Mr. Bergan is really, um, you know, really wanted to have service in there because he really views their department as a service, you know, they're providing service to all city departments. So, um, and they've, and he's been doing a phenomenal job uh, with the staff that he has, and I have no doubt that he's going to really bring together this new team, um, and uh, and really we'll we'll have a first class IT department. Mayor, when do you think all this would happen as far as consolidating and going to the James House? Well, what's happening now is you've um, you know you'll have the vote. Um, uh, right now, currently, the former uh, tenant um, in the um, in the James House moved out at the beginning of November, and we've been our, our central service staff have been doing some work in there already. Um, it's pretty much a wide open space, and and uh, you know the IT department is going to be pretty much a wide open, very flexible workspace, and um, so there's some minimal stuff that's being done there, um, and so the goal is. Um, in fairness to Mr. Pagan, he's, his days and nights have been spent planning this new phone system installation, which is going to start take off next Monday. And then he's also been working on a major, um, uh, this um, permitting software, uh, Municity, that we're um, beta testing and doing a bunch of stuff on. So he's been working on that. So, um, so he's actually grateful that it wouldn't be till January. So probably around January okay. um, is when that would happen. Um, but we're sort of leaving it flexible. Uh, the main thing is that the team start working together, and then we'll get them in a in a in a proper space. I think this is a great move. Thank you. Any other questions? So before the vote, I'm actually going to read the order. So uh, this is order that whereas the City of Northampton and the Northampton Public Schools, or MPS, currently share services in the area of both facilities and personnel management through our consolidated central services and human resources departments, and Whereas the mayor and the MPS superintendent determined that expanding this service uh, sharing to include information technology services through a consolidated information technology services department is in the best interest of our city and school district. And whereas the Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 71, subsection 37M states that municipalities, quote, may consolidate administrative functions, including but not limited to financial personnel and maintenance functions of the school committee with those of the city or town, provided, however, that such consolidation may occur only upon a majority vote of both the school committee and in the city, the city council with approval of the mayor." Close quote. And whereas on November 10th, 2016, the Northampton School Committee voted unanimous, unanimously to authorize the consolidation of city and school committee information technology service functions in accordance with the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 71, subsection 37M. And so, now therefore, be it ordered that the City Council hereby authorize the consolidation of information technology services functions of the City and the School Committee in accordance with the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 71, subsection 37M. And I should just say that um, uh, this is watching the evolution of our IT services go, go, dating back to the early to mid 90s um, this is actually a welcome consolidation and it and I suppose it had to evolve the way the road systems evolved in Massachusetts starting off as goat paths and not following any particular grid or rhyme or reason and now the city is actually uh, has been striving for and is actually I think achieving um, a higher functioning system that that is actually as critical as any other service and infrastructure service that we have in the city. And it's the one that you don't see, but it's the one that we, the, the level of reliance is, is huge, and especially in the area of education. So I, 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 I agree with everyone who's, who said that, that this, uh, this reeks of wisdom, if you will. So, um, okay. Uh, any other discussion on this point? Okay. Uh, roll call. This is for first reading. The second reading will be December 15th. Uh, of course, also at the same time, we'll be having the hearing about the administrative order that would make this all jive. So, roll call, please. Councillor Dwight? 
Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shira. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Yes. That passes in first reading. Next up, uh, a number of second readings and ordinances is item 16.158. This is an ordinance relative to the to uh, the photovoltaic systems and related accessory structures in various zoning districts. Move approval. Second. Discussion. Roll call, please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shira. Yes. Councilor Kibble. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. That passes in second reading. Um, item 16.175, an ordinance to amend. We did that. Whoa, whoa. Yes, we did. We did it. We just bop that up. Yes. Really, everyone knows that but me. Item 16.182, this is an ordinance regarding no parkings uh, certain times in the roundhouse lot. This is second reading. Move approval. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Can I just call you? Sorry. You did, but on the last okay. vote. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Lavar. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. 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 That passes in second reading. Um, the only announcement I would have to say is that uh, you have on your desks or on your mail, and also via email from um, Pam, the information to the MMA conference in January for those who are interested in going. Um, I suspect this year will be, I think the agenda is probably going to get scrambled a little from what it was anticipated a little while ago. So it, I, it'll be <coughs> some interesting conversations and, and, and Councilor Nash, I commend it to you. It's a, there's tchotchkes. <laughs> you can get lots of stress balls and pens and stuff. So. Again. Yeah, again. You mean tchotchkes of knowledge. Tchotchkes of knowledge is what I meant. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Tchotchkes of wisdom again. Where's, okay. It's on inauguration day. So. Yeah. Oh, really? There's going to be a special viewing set up for people who want to watch. Yeah, I'm a, okay. Well, I'm a supposed bar? to go to Washington the next day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's tricky. Yeah, I'm going to D.C. the next day, so we'll see when that plays out. Okay. Um, there are no other, uh, Council Murphy. I just, I'm sorry I missed one minute's an announcements. It would have been more appropriate, but I'd, I'd like to note the passing of Charles Alliance, Charlie Alliance, a young man who grew up in Northampton, University. after his military service returned, ran a family business in Northampton for many, many years, was very civic minded, did a lot for the community. Um, and his passing, I wanted to note and offer the council's condolences to his family. He was a, um, contributed to our business community, to our social community, to our civic community, and it's sad to lose somebody like that. So, thank you for the time. And thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Councilor Bidwell. Um, similarly, this would have been more appropriate one minute announcements, but you reminded me. I, I too would like to note the, the passing of a real leader in our community, uh, Andy Pollock, longtime uh, director of the Cutchin Center and chair of the board of the YMCA, uh, lost his struggle with pancreatic cancer and died last night. Big loss. I, I didn't know that. Thank you. Okay. I'll accept a motion for All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. We are adjourned.